Um, we're now going to continue on to our next uh, session, which is the forum session for digitization and cyber security. Um, cyber security in particular is a, is a topic which will begin to concern all of us in shipping in years to come. I think at this stage, in my personal view at least, I think it's been underestimated as to what the issues may arise. And I think we're very fortunate today we have some uh, good presentations. So press the alert button to ensure that we're ready for situations, to make sure that we're ready for the cyber risks and not having to face the consequence of it. On that note, I'd like to present um, our moderator, Mrs. Espina Fadosiu, and uh, she can come make a presentation, and then you can actually formulate and, and, uh, and uh, mediate with, with, your, with your panel. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our panel discussion. First of all, Thank you, Nikos, Olga, and the whole team. Uh, it's great to have you back, and it's a great conference, so hoping for the next one as well. Um, today, I have the pleasure, pleasure to, to welcome uh, two associates, two um, partners, uh, who are here to discuss and um, share with us their views on blockchain and cybersecurity. So please let me welcome uh, Matthew Galston, Senior Director, Product Management Maritime at Copham Satcom. Hello, Matt. And Drew Brandy, S Senior Vice President, Market Strategy at Inmarsat Maritime. Welcome, Drew. Digital enablement provides opportunities for businesses and individuals. It offers the opportunity for our industry to seek new efficiencies that were never available before and offer customers more transparency, more openness, and more value for money. But while any opportunity can provide a huge gain for business development, it does, of course, come with the risk of misuse, both accidental and opportunistic. What I want to do today, what we want to do is talk about uh, when we accept technology in our business lives, we do so without needing to know exactly how it works, therefore with an element of trust. So while we accept that things work, we should also accept the value of good safety and security. Um, what I'm saying is, um, I mean, do, do we all know how the internet works or how the, computer, the password on our computer works? Probably not, but we accept them. What about online banking? There are apps on, for your phones that allow you to transfer money as quickly as pressing a button. They are convenient, quick, and we trust that they're secure because they make things easier and quicker. So it is right that we take the same approach in our business lives. We should be seeking the systems and solutions that are able to make our businesses easier to conduct and make our customers happy. But we need to do so with a solid insight into how the security works, but without maybe knowing the intricacies of it. Cyber security is like a game of one-manship, and it is a necessary one. When society invented locks for front doors, criminals <coughs> soon became lock pickers. When we made more complex physical locks, they found more complex ways to get what they wanted. It is the same in the digital world. In society, we are taking risks more, uh, more uh, seriously. There were 1,093 data breaches in 2016 in the US alone. That was an increase of 40% from the previous year. That's three breaches a day. And I'm not even talking about phishing, denial of service attacks, and other cyber crimes. But that was 2016, and this is 2018. So what has changed? First, we are taking it more seriously in society and in business. And I think in shipping too, we have woken up. We are far more aware. By far, the biggest alarm was last year when AP Moller Maersk announced it fell victim to the NordPetya malware. This was uh, malware that took advantage of certain uh, vulnerabilities in Windows, and Maersk found out just how vulnerable it was. The impact of MERS was that it took two weeks to resolve and it hit the company's bottom line by $300 million. But despite the probable urge to remain quiet, the company made a public statement very quickly after the attack. For one, 
I wish all companies could be more open about these things so we can share and learn from each other. It is important. This may sound like land-based problems and risks, and some may be wondering what this has to do with my floating asset out at sea, or even why should I then connect my ship, like everyone is, is talking about, if there are all these risks? These are good questions, but one must look at the benefits of connectivity when one considers not having it at all, and then the cost of our awareness and prevention. Being aware of the risks and having a sensible approach to them is the way to move this debate forward. Do you know, there is currently in a proposal in the UK to make CEOs um, uh, take more responsibility for cybersecurity. It was put forward and, uh, by MPs, and while it is mainly aimed at companies with personal data of consumers, it does show how seriously the issue is. It shows how a government is pushing senior executives to take cybersecurity seriously, and it will spread to B2B businesses. What we want to talk about today is how new solutions such as blockchain and other answers are evolving to become part of our security framework for our, our industry. Insurers are also taking this issue more seriously. Just three weeks ago, the International Union of Marine Insurers uh, published its annual list of issues. These are the ongoing topical areas that are, are of concern to the marine insurance community. Cybersecurity rates highly on its list of concerns, not only because of the risks, but from an insurance point of view, the lack of visibility of the risk. Moving on from that, what about blockchain? This digital ledger technology that is distributed across numerous um, systems has the potential to create a new level of security. It became the buzzword of 2017, but will evolve into a solution in 2018. There are emerging collaborations uh, in blockchain across our industry already. BIMCO has said it is of interest to contracts. Container weight verification and CO2 emissions under current EU regulations are areas where shipboard data needs levels of security to prevent fraud and hacking. There's also interest in using blockchain in bills of lading, letters of credit, port documents, and other cargo-related areas, particularly as we see the principles of e-navigation, e-maritime, and the single window reporting platforms become more used. But one of the unique opportunities with blockchain is to potentially link up many different aspects of the industry on one platform. Just like um, the language that led to the creation of the current internet. And this will allow shipping and maritime to be connected to other parts of the logistics and supply chain and other industries that were never considered possible before to do so in a time stamp stamped ledger. Blockchain can open the opportunity for great transparency, efficiency, collaboration, and better audit trail. But I think that's for me, for me it's uh, uh, an introduction to what we're about to discuss, and uh, I would then like to move on to the questions and cut to the chase <coughs> directly and ask you, um, how can we reassure the maritime, shipping, oil and gas, and indeed any industry, that the benef benefits of digitalization are worth the risk? Well, um, first of all, thank you all for uh, the opportunity to participate in today's event. Um, it's, uh, it's a unique one for me. Uh, it's my first time in Cyprus, which is, is a lovely place to be. Um, yeah, but uh, it's also a, a, a unique opportunity, whereas normally uh, we at Cobham are primarily engaging with uh, the other service providers, such as, as our partners at Inmarsat and Toloteo. Uh, there's less opportunity for us to engage directly with the market, with the end users, and to sort of understand a little bit more about where things are in your world and how we can do better. Um, so a couple of points uh, that somewhat relate to the question. I think the answer uh, in terms of how can we reassure is, is, is a bit of a uh, putting it back to you all, is, is that I'm not sure that we can. Um, Cybersecurity, and whether we're talking about it in the context of satellites uh, and, and ships, uh, or whether we're talking about it in terms of 
enterprise data network. Uh, cybersecurity has always been a bit of a hot potato. It's passed around from one department to another, somebody else's problem. Uh, the way that we engage with it uh, in our business lives is, is inevitably through something that we find incredibly annoying, whether it's uh, an, an RSA token or it's the inability to connect to your company's network when you're on business travel and you can't get your emails. I mean, it's, it's just something that is seen as a problem. But thankfully, there are people who are addressing this problem uh, and who have taken the action to understand it deeply and, and come up with some solutions that allow us to forget about it, to sort of export that uh, you know, knowledge out of our brain and just assume that uh, things will be taken care of. But I don't think necessarily that the maritime industry has that luxury. Um, we are dealing with an incredible amount of data. Uh, we're dealing with 90% of the world's goods at any given time on board our ships. And I have a feeling that um, you know, there is a, a mindset shift that needs to take place uh, from looking at it as something that's costly and, and you know, sort of time intensive and potentially hazardous to looking at it as something that may actually be able to deliver some value. And I have a feeling that much like the conversation about digitalization in general, those who embrace it and be, you know, dive right directly into the subject matter and determine a way to uh, you know, take advantage of it in a positive way, not just to save money, but to make new money, uh, those are going to be the ones that, that emerge successful through all of this. And so if you look at cyber security as, as a parallel to digitalization in general, uh, I believe that uh, you have the sort of parallel between looking at cybersecurity purely from a risk mitigation perspective and trying to shift your thinking to looking at it as potentially a value driver. Again, those networks, those companies that are able to sort of put their stamp on it and say, our data is secure, therefore your data is secure, you can take that to the bank. They're, they're going to be the ones that come out on top moving forward. What's your take on this? Thank you. Um, well, first, good, good morning, good afternoon. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to be here and uh, share some thoughts with you on, on what I think is quite an interesting topic at an interesting and uh, point in the maritime industry. Um, I work for Marsat, and I suspect most of you will be familiar with, with the Marsat as a satellite broadband provider. Um, who effectively provides connectivity at sea. And we've seen our industry change over the past three decades. And when we talk about um, issues such as cybersecurity and blockchain, these are all um, challenges and opportunities associated with the digital era, which is the world we're operating in today. So I sit here in front of you almost bemused by the fact that we're having a conversation about the risk associated with this. and talking about whether or not we should embrace digitalization. The reality is it's here, it's happening. There is no opportunity for us to embrace this. It's about, it's about understanding the impact that it will have on our industry and making sure that we are driving it in a way that it's uh, uh, delivering the best benefit for us as organizations. So how do we, how do we go about doing that? Well, there's a number of ways. Um, obviously, cyber um, uh, is, is, is an issue that um, certainly with the announcement, the very bold announcement by MERSC last year, um, is on the maritime agenda to a much greater extent. But let's be clear that this has been happening for some time. All industries have been attacked at some point in time. Um, the issue is that most are reluctant to communicate that. Um, because there's, uh, there's an association of your organization isn't secure, isn't taking the necessary precautions to, to try and avoid or mitigate against that. Well, there's a number of things you can do, and it, it starts really with people. It's education and awareness. If we even look at the maritime industry, a lot of the threats that are faced are, are down to people on board bringing um, USB sticks or plugging things into ECTIS systems or into various systems on board that um, are contaminating um, and causing problems. So I think there's a real issue around ensuring that we're securing um, by making sure that our, our staff, that people are aware of the challenges associated with that, and then putting in place the, the relevant processes and policies to, to safeguard where possible. But we're never going to be 100% secure. This is a challenge that all industries face. The only thing we can do is, is to try and reduce the risk of attack by making sure that we are protecting 
our, our vessels and the industry to, to, the, to the greatest possible extent. But the broader theme for me around digitalization is, is what are the benefits? How do we, how do we as an industry um, look to uh, capitalize on what is happening? Um, from, again, from a satellite perspective, we are bringing, as well as other operators, connectivity to the maritime industry at a, at a parallel rate. And the amount of data that's being generated from vessels is, is now allowing them to make um, decisions about um, navigation, about fuel consumption, um, about the way that they operate that vessel to be more operationally efficient. Um, we're seeing crew adopt it and increasingly the new generation of seafarers are actually refusing to go to sea on vessels that don't provide connectivity because this is the world that they've grown up in. And they've got an expectation that whether they're on land, in the air, or at sea, that connectivity is a reality. And what's important for us to recognize is it's not just a reality for social media, but for most of us in our day-to-day -day jobs, the internet is a vital problem-solving tool. When we can't figure out how to do something or we encounter a problem we've not encountered before, we'll often go to the internet and research it to look for solutions. And in many ways, depriving seafarers of that functionality is depriving them of a, of a tool that's vital to help them learn and to evolve in their, in their work. So I think we need to really change our mindset in terms of the way that we adopt connectivity. We need to change our mindset in terms of the role of digitalization and not see this as, as a threat, something that's going to um, negatively impact our industry, but understand how we can work with it, how we can benefit from that and make the industry more efficient, make it safer, make it more productive, and then ultimately um, generate more revenue um, and new industries that will emerge from this new digital era as well, which I haven't touched upon, but I suspect we'll get on to. Yeah. Um, to actually touch upon um, my, my next question, but um, I would like to ask it anyway, because I think there are a, there are a lot of aspects to it. And um, the question is, what do we need to be aware of when it comes to proper cyber uh, attitudes? I, I feel there is a need to ensure that our industry, the shipping industry, is aware of all the benefits and the huge benefits that are coming with the changes that we have, but uh, at the same time ensure them that uh, we as providers are on their side. So what do you think about that? So yeah, from that perspective, I think Drew touched on well that it, it's a mindset shift. It's, it's almost a need to uh, embrace the, the requirements and, and the, the, the knowledge uh, that is required to execute a good cybersecurity strategy from more of a cultural perspective. Um, you know, we on the terminal development side have, I think, a little bit less of a role to play in all of this than potentially the network operators themselves. Uh, although there is a there is a piece to it, and we've been asked many times by by customers saying, you know, we've, we've heard of reports where actually there was, you know, okay, here's an opportunity for me to sort of say, come out and 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 uh, and, and let you know that uh, you know we have been attacked. So there was a. Um, Editor of uh, some sort of uh, Wired magazine or something like that, not not Wired, but another one, who took the action to try to hack a uh, Sailor 900 VSAT antenna and was successful in doing so, and was able to, you know, obviously without malintent, but demonstrate that he could sort of take control of the ship's network uh, using that weak point of entry. Now, the second half goes on to say that the way he got in was by going online and finding an old service manual and entering a factory default password, which nobody had bothered to change. I can't necessarily say that we could have done much to prevent that because we have to find a way to enable people to access the terminal uh, you know, using some type of default credential, but it is ultimately on them to make sure that they then take the action of changing that password and following the sort of standard best practices of IT security. And so my point in all this is to say that there, there are those basic top 10 principles that you can probably Google and read about uh, in, in 10 seconds, and those are going to ultimately be the things which prevent the most attacks from occurring. So empowering everybody from you know, the corporate level all the way down to the guys uh, on the ships, you know, working down in the engine rooms and such with the knowledge and the tools they need and the practices to follow 
and then sort of creating some ability to continuously follow up and measure uh, the success on, on implementing those tools is really a key, a key piece of the puzzle for me. I'm going to put a, a question to the audience, which is how many people in this room have been on a cyber training course in the last six months? Can I see a show of hands? How about the last 12 months? The last two years? So that, in essence, answers the question, really. Um, this is an issue that is it's evolving, and, and, and people who are posing these threats maliciously are, are finding new and clever ways, as Matt said, to access company systems. And often they access it through people. Um, and, and as an industry, if we're failing to educate our people as to this very real threat, if we're failing to put the policies and procedures in place to mitigate against that, and more importantly, if we're not working with our staff, our employees, to help them understand where the risks are, then we are putting our organizations at jeopardy. And so for me, it really starts with that understanding as to what, what is a risk, what does that look like, how does it materialize, and then what do you do to try and ensure that you are managing that to a reasonable degree. Now, as Matt said, there's always going to be there. There's certain things that we can't change. Um, but if we're not at least taking some very basic measures in terms of education and awareness, then we've got fundamental problems in terms of how we tackle this. And the challenge I see is, yes, it's very topical. Everyone is speaking about it, and that's important. That's the first step. But the second step is action, and the action isn't yet being taken. And that's what we need to see change in the maritime industry. Um, there are several press reports on uh, the advancement of technology in our industry. And, well, both your companies are at the heart of this uh, technology change and the advancement. So my question is, how should we distinguish media high from a, a new digital reality? And how can we find the balance? And also, maybe as a side question, what is the role of digitalization when it comes to crews? Um, well, first, I, I'm a firm believer that we shouldn't adopt technology for technology's sake. You should start with an understanding and look at what you're trying to achieve as an organization. Um, there's a lot of different suppliers of bandwidth. There's new satellites being launched on a, on a very regular basis that offer you different functionality, different capacity. Um, ultimately, um, they're offering you um, broadband at sea to enable you to take data off your vessel and communicate with shore-based organizations, or vice versa, to transmit data from shore to, to your vessel to make decisions um, about how you, how you choose to operate. Um, so it really starts with first looking at what sorts of data you're transmitting, what sorts of decisions are you trying to make, and then ultimately utilizing a technology that's going to support that. Um, what we're seeing increasingly is that um, there's really sort of four activities um, that we're typically engaged with, which is um, bridge to shore communications, which is perhaps the historic part of our, of our business, um, chart updates, communications between the, the bridge and shore, um, crew communications, which is increasingly generating more traffic on our network. It's, it's an expectation, it's a demand from seafarers that they have, have connectivity. And while that has, let's say the industry's been a little slower to embrace that, we've really seen that change in the last couple of years. Um, safety, any sorts of systems that are reporting, um, our MRSAT sea service, which Cobham provides, is, is a safety service for any um, vessels over 300 gross tons. Um, but the other piece of this is what is really exciting is, is IoT, which is the Internet of Things. And that's hitting the maritime industry at an unparalleled rate, where we're seeing every system on board a, 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 a merchant vessel um, having some sort of sensor and being able to then monitor the performance of the engine, to monitor any aspect of that, to be able to take um, corrective action if, if, if there's risk of, of, of a vessel breaking down, or to know when to schedule maintenance just to ensure that you're operating from an efficient perspective. 
So I think there's a lot of things that are happening in the industry in terms of <laughs> the role of technology, but it also depends on where you sit along that sort of continuum and what you're trying to achieve. That ultimately is how you should be selecting uh, um, the technology that's right for you. So um, I, I couldn't agree more with everything Drew said. Uh, I would maybe put a little bit of a, a different spin on it to say, so there were kind of two parts to your question, I think. First, first was, you know, what is, what is fact and fiction within digitalization? And, and um, you know, for me, I think one important distinction to make uh, is, is about the conversation that has been happening around data and IoT and uh, you know, all types of uh, big ideas that we are continuously discussing in the industry, whether at conferences or in the press or so on. Um, I think that we have reached a cycle in the discussion where we have clearly identified what is possible in the future, and there's a lot of exciting things that could come from this. But I think it's also a good moment for us to then take a step back and take you know, a, a time to sort of identify what are the practical steps that we need to take to move forward and to get to that future state of complete digitalization, automation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, for me, it's to kind of stop looking at satellite internet on ships as somehow different than the internet. It's not. It's just simple connectivity. It's a business enablement tool. And to, to, to change your thinking in that direction uh, may free up uh, some, some capacity to kind of see it as an investment opportunity, not solely with the intent of achieving greater efficiency, which clearly has been demonstrated to be possible, uh, not solely for the objective of cost saving, which of course, uh, you know, given all the discussion that we've heard this morning on, on the economics of the industry is of paramount importance. But I think people start to pay a lot more attention to the discussions about new solutions and new technologies when the conversation shifts from possible cost savings to possible new revenue generation, new services, higher margin. This type of conversation gets a lot more attention from a different audience within your company. It's not just the CTO organization anymore who's showing up. Now it's the you know, CFO and, and chief executive uh, type of profile that's, that's paying attention. So I think we need to look at examples from other industries where there have been successful implementations of using data to generate new <coughs> revenue. Uh, and I can think of one just off the top of my head um, where I used to work before getting involved in, in antennas. I was, I was working in, uh, in the satellite imaging world, Earth observation. Now you see, you know, every day it seems like more and more of these operators launching new satellites to image the Earth. And what are they doing with it? Well, they're doing things like counting the number of cars in every Walmart parking lot every single day. And then using those estimates to inform Wall Street traders about what the, what the likelihood of Walmart being a quarter target is going to be. They're using those images combined with multiple layers of other data sets that are gathered on the ground and kind of cross-referencing everything and doing analytics to figure out what the actual price of oil is going to be before the reports come out six weeks later. There's incredible amounts of data to unlock, uh, new value and new insight. And I think that when the, looking at it from the Earth observation perspective, almost all the services that you see, and especially the ones I just mentioned, come as a result of combining pictures from space with data from the ground. Now, there's lots of data on the ground where you have Earth. There's 70% of the world's surface that is covered by ocean, where you don't have sensors. You don't have data coming back. But there are ships out there. And I think there's a lot of exhaust, ones and zeros, coming out of our operations that are potentially valuable to some pretty huge industries. IBM bought the weather company last year for $2 billion. I doubt it's because they're interested in telling people when to bring their umbrella. It is because they want to take that ground network sensor uh, data, which they have 60,000 weather stations around the world, and plug it into Watson so that they can uh, unlock what they have evaluated as a 600 million, uh, sorry, 600 billion dollar industry uh, in, in form of insurance services and, and gra greater granularity of what, uh, you know, risk, risk profile reduction, uh, premium reduction and, and, and essentially value-driven uh, services in the, in the insurance space. So what role can Maritime play in that? And if that maybe puts a light bulb in people's head to start thinking about things in a new way, then maybe we get some more attention on the topic. As pertains to the crew specifically, empowering crew with digital capability is empowering the people who know the nuts and bolts of your operation better than anybody and gives them a voice in the conversation. It gives them the ability to innovate within their daily lives. 
in the way that we all do in our offices. But if you're on a ship and only have access to email from time to time, you're really not using your full potential. Well, the point I'd, I'd, I'd add, or slightly challenge, Matt, um, is that the 80,000 merchant vessels um, all represent um, data sensors or opportunities to gather data. So when we talk about the 70% of the world that isn't covered, in essence, it is covered. That's what I'm saying. It's yeah. just we haven't figured out how to utilize that data. And so one of the challenges I always see is we talk about big data, um, and we're not really sure within the maritime industry what to do with that, um, how to really, it's also about the processing power to be able to then analyze and then to take decisions. The data in itself is, is raw. Ones and zeros, as you said, it's irrelevant. It's what you do with that data. And those sorts of things that Matt's talking about are beginning to happen in other industries. And what we do see in other industries is it's, it's organizations from outside of those industries that come in and ultimately disrupt by bringing these sort of concepts to, 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 to fruition. Um, who's going to disrupt the maritime industry? Because there will be organizations that will be looking at the amount of data that's being generated and recognize that there's an opportunity to package that and resell that, whether it's environmental <coughs> data. Um, that is an opportunity that um, exists today, but really is being tapped into. And, and my only thing there is I totally agree, but maybe it's not such a threat. It's, it's potentially something we should embrace. We should be having the conversation with the, the Googles of the world, with the, you know, the Facebooks, the Amazons, the, the orbital insights, these kinds of companies, Skybox, uh, Planet Labs, these kinds of companies that are thirsty to use this data for specific industry value added services may very well be interested to talk to us, but it, it, it requires us to open our mind a bit and consider sharing something that right now everybody is very concerned about securing and protecting where let's take a look at whether we really need to secure and protect certain types of data that we have. This is a very interesting dis discussion, and I think George uh, had a question. Yes, I'll give a different dimension to this whole uh, topic. Um, first, it's a statement, it's a question. In fact, both questions. Uh, we all fly a lot. Are you all aware of that, what happened on the British Airways flight landing in London Heathrow a couple of years ago? There was a kid about 18, 20 years old with about two and a half, three thousand pounds worth of electronic gadgets. And he succeeded in accessing the software of the end of the plane. And as the pilot was landing at London Heathrow, he succeeded in having the plane diverted and actually took control of the plane, diverted off the runway. And if we think of lucky stars, they happened to be an efficient uh, captain who happened to override the automation system and get the plan to plane to land, land safely aground. So, if we, ladies and gentlemen, in the cyber risk problem, if in the aviation industry we find issues like that, and God forbid we are all flying on airplanes all the time, and you find that a, a, a teenager kid can actually have access to the software with the view of diverting the plane, imagine, just use your imagination, some lateral thinking as to what risk we may run in the shipping industry. The second question, and I think I just caught my eye, I caught Mr. Sean Willison from the insurance uh, broker from Jardines that's over on the corner, is that are you aware <laughs> of the fact that most uh, marine insurance policies with the famous clause 380, I don't know why they always refer to it as 380, is the clause which suggests that if you have any damage or anything arising on, on, a, on a ship, either in terms of a casualty or a breakdown, which is remotely uh, in, involving a cyber risk, then the insurance policy does not cover you under that thing, does not cover you. Now, there are certain variations which have taken place. The view has been expressed that you've got the protection from the, or the insurance from the PNI cover, but that's their discretionary cover, so you're not quite sure whether you fully covered. On that particular point, because I think it's a very serious issue, uh, could I call upon Saul and Connery to give us a view about how the insurance cover stands in a standard insurance main policy today? Uh, well, thank you, George, uh, for the, uh, I thought I'd walk up pretty bit easier. Um, I'll be very brief, um, because I'm sure this might be covered a little bit later on in the uh, insurance section, but um, <coughs> as far as the insurance industry is concerned, um, cyber is something that obviously we all have to face. Um, 
I remember 2015, we actually had a maritime Cyprus where we talked about vessel automation and cyber exposures. And um, yeah, that's, that's the advancement in the industry and the shipping insurance industry is here to support whatever happens in the shipping industry itself. I think on the issue of cyber, we've probably been found a little bit wanting, uh, if I'm honest. Um, trying to get your head around cyber exposure is really, from an insurance perspective, about aggregation. I mean, aggregation of risk across the world fleet, if there was a cyber attack that affected every single vessel, would create an enormous exposure for the insurance industry. Um, they've now got their heads around that, I'm pleased to, uh, to tell you, and in fact, uh, we're about to launch a, uh, a new cyber product that will address this issue. And it's going to address issues like data protection, uh, which is one issue, and there's always been data protection insurance available. It's the fastest growing audit code in Lloyd's at the moment. And then we've also got the issue of ransomware, which is where we've had vessels potentially held to ransom by people that are able to intercept the technology on board. Then you have the issue of physical damage, and physical damage caused by a cyber attack. And that's where the clause 380 uh, exclusion clause actually takes out the cover for a cyber uh, incident. If you delete that exclusion, you don't actually have cyber cover, especially if you're under ITC. Uh, and that, that's the problem. People think if you don't have 380 in your insurance policy, you've got cyber insurance cover. That's not the case. There's also a big debate going on about whether the cyber risk itself would sit in your hull policy or your war policy. Is it malicious damage? Generally it is, but you can have non-malicious damage. And all these issues uh, have been at the top of the agenda in the marine insurance market, as uh, has been mentioned, the uh, IUMI is one of the top priorities. The industry is now getting its head around it, and hopefully very shortly uh, we'll have uh, coverage in place. Made. There is cover available at the moment. It's got aggregation limits because of the issues I mentioned earlier. Hopefully we'll have something that's slightly more palatable and addresses the issue very shortly. Sure, thank you. Very much, for the answer, because you have to think out of the box, because otherwise we have to think of the solution to problems before they arise. After you. Thank you very much. So um, we don't have any time for a closing statement from both of you or a closing comment. Yeah, uh, just related to this last one, which is an interesting point. I think within the two examples, uh, sort of topics that you brought up, George, you have well, essentially given us cause and effect, right? Uh, and we have now. A situation where, okay, so the insurance guys have started to wrap their head around how can we package something that will give uh, some, some protection against these types of attacks. And presumably that protection must carry some requirements uh, to, to follow certain practices or, or demonstrate that you have a plan in place uh, and a policy to, to mitigate risk uh, from this perspective. So if that is the cause and the effect is that, uh, you know, when still some type of hack occurs in the case of the airline pilot, it comes then down to, are you empowering your, your people on board? Are you empowering your employees to be able to do exactly what that airline pilot did? In the case of uh, you know total malicious attack and, and seeking control of the, of the vessel or aircraft, in this case, do you people know what to do? And that's ultimately down to each and every one of our companies <coughs> deciding to, to take the, the necessary steps to put the program in place, which gives them the knowledge to do that. Um, that's on that topic, but, but uh, uh, I guess just as a general closing point for me, um, that last example just highlights the fact that it's a collective responsibility um, in terms of education awareness and policy in place to address some of these issues, whether you're talking about cyber or even the introduction of connectivity on board your vessel should be about creating awareness so it's used responsibly, having the right sort of policy in place to make sure that you're getting the best value out of that. Um, so it behooves us as a satellite operator to make sure that that's available, but we need to work with the wider industry to make sure it's adopted in a way that makes sense for the industry. And again, the importance of partnerships in this industry is becoming more and more vital as it transforms in a digital environment. Okay, so it seems we have time for just one time for just one question from the audience. If there's anyone who has a question. Hello, good morning. 
One question. Um, what will happen with the, when the automated ships are? What are you going to do with the side prison? How are you going to protect yourselves? Can I, can I answer that one? Um, automated ships, I have a little bit of a smile on my face because, you know, quite frankly, I know I'm going to get a revolution in the room now, but it ain't going to happen. She didn't ask about unmanned ships, she said automated ships. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I think uh, it, it still is a bit of the same answer that, you know, so automated ships are, are certainly a hot topic, and, and I think you made a good point that there is a, a misperception and potentially a confusion between automated or autonomous versus completely unmanned, right? You're still going to have staff on board, uh, and, and you're still going to have to make sure that they know exactly what to do. Um, and, and you're you know, going to have to embrace new, te new technology solutions and make sure that you're uh, keeping ahead of all the, the sort of latest hacking technology. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about knowledge management and knowledge sharing and, uh, and training and, and practice and following the standard best practices to ensure that you're not at risk. Uh, just a last comment. I, again, it's, it's like part of this broader digital digitalization conversation. Autonomy is happening now. This isn't something that's down the road. Vessels are increasingly becoming more autonomous. And it's, it's, a, it's a journey that we'll see um, more and more systems on board to um, try and improve the efficiency of these vessels. But again, similarly, the, the technology has to be there as well as the policy to ensure that you are able to address those sorts of issues. Because often the danger is technology sometimes outstrips or outpaces regulation and policy, all of those things have to happen in conjunction to make sure that the technology is delivered in an efficient, effective way. Captain, you want to question, so? Captain, a bit short of the camp, because we're yeah. being, I'm being um, a friend looks up here. Um, thank you for scaring us again with the cybersecurity stuff, and thank you for the insurance industry to have the we response ready. We tried the opposite. Ready. We tried the opposite to reassure you a little bit. No. Yeah, but you you make us now to buy insurance cover, and I just want to know. <laughs> are we up to embark the same road with um, um, kidnap and ransom insurance packages, where ship owners pay? billions of dollars in insurance premiums, whereas the actual ransom was in millions which has been paid to pirates. Can we be careful with what we are doing here? Thank you. I think that's a, a, a very good point and probably one that should be discussed during the insurance uh, segments later. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have to say thank the panel. Um, I'm sorry for the overrun, but the topic was quite volatile, so we were a bit, a little bit naughty. Um, I'd like to thank you both all very much for your presentations. Thank you very much. And then go on to the next session, which is... Uh, the